move on to our tonight's presentation, which is Finding ET, the Scientific Search for Life in the Universe. And on the screen, you can see Dr. Jerry Lips. Uh, Professor Lips received his undergraduate degree and PhD from UCLA. Then as a professor, he taught a variety of geology, paleontology, and biology at UC Davis and UC Berkeley. He has served as director, J.D. Cooper Archaeological and Paleontological Center, Santa Ana, 2012 to 2016. Faculty curator in the Museum of Paleontology, University of California, Berkeley, 1988 until today, and continuing. Uh, Director of Museum of Paleontology, University of California, Berkeley, 1989 to 98, and Chair, Department of Integrative Biology, University of California, Berkeley, 1991 to 94. He has over 500 publications, many concerning astrobiology and the search for life beyond Earth. He has had an Antarctic island, Rips Island, named in his honor, and has received many awards, such as the Antarctic Medal of the U.S., and is the Distinguished Professor of the Graduate School Department of Integrated Biology and Museum of Paleontology, University of California, Berkeley. So I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Lips. Thanks very much, Dave. I really appreciate it. And it's really great to be with you guys uh, this evening. I'd certainly like to be, be there in person, but I happen to be down in Baja, California, kind of avoiding the virus up there. And so we'll do this by Zoom from my uh, site here on the Sea of Cortez. So I love Mount Diablo. Are you all living around Mount Diablo somewhere? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we established uh, back in the 90s the trail through time from the top of Mount Diablo down to the, uh, <coughs> down to the uh, floor of it from the Jurassic to the Miocene. And it's been a while since I've walked that trail through time, and I was wondering if all the monuments that we put up as explanations are still in place. Anybody ever know? Yeah, I'm seeing one or two on the way a little between the, uh, the, uh, the summit and then the junction. And, uh, the, uh, He's not going to be able to hear it. So I heard I, I heard some of it. Yeah, so between halfway between summit and then the, the halfway between summit and junction uh, ranger station and the trail, you can see it. Great, great. Glad to hear it. Well, my main fields of study are geology, paleontology, and marine biology. And I love those fields. And what I particularly like about them is that I can bring all three of those disciplines together and make a contribution to astrobiology. And that's really an exciting field for me. So I'd like to give you a presentation on where we stand with astrobiology today in general, and that will include a number of things. So let me uh, share my presentation with you, if I can get this going. Okay, so let's talk about a few terms first. This field of astrobiology that we are calling it nowadays, it used to be called exobiology by NASA and people working in the field. And exobiology referred to life off the earth, anywhere in space. The famous evolutionary biologist, George Gaylord Simpson said, exobiology was a discipline that had yet to discover its subject, which is true even to today. Astrogeology, of course, is the geology of any solid body from planets to meteorites. Astrobiology is the biology, not just of things in space or in the solar system, but also including Earth, because 
Earth is the, our only example of life. And so we want to know about it so that we can compare whatever we find and whatever we're trying to find on other planets. And then there's the field of astropaleontology, which is new field, but it's gaining prominence with the launch of uh, Perseverance last year. And then recently, uh, the idea of astroarchaeology has been proposed. And I guess the one example right now would be SETI, which is searching for ancient uh, civilizations using radio waves. So what is an extraterrestrial, an ET? Well, this probably springs to mind, at least if you're a little kid-like guy, but it's really not. So what would we expect? Well, probably not this, neither of these, maybe some of these single-celled eukaryotes like this planktonic foraminifera might make it because it's rather simple in form, but pretty complex as a cell. And then there's bacteria and bacteria are what we really expect. In fact, Peter Ward wrote a book called Rare Earth in which he described how bacteria are probably the only thing we're gonna find on other planets, if that, making Earth with all of its diverse life rather rare. And of course, these single cells do not have an organized nucleus like the eukaryotes do. And they're much simpler probably to make from the beginning. And they've been around for three and a half billion years at least on the earth. So this is one of the primary targets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about perseverance. There's another group that are like bacteria called archaea. They're genetically quite distinct, but they look very similar. And then there are a number of other biological materials like viruses, for example, that are, that are possible in, in outer space. So this is the James Webb uh, Space Telescope first picture that was released a couple weeks ago, looking back 13.7 billion years. That's just 300 million or so shy of the Big Bang. And in this picture, you can see thousands of galaxies. Someone said there are 3,000 galaxies in this picture. I haven't counted them. But anyway, it is a sample of the universe that's overwhelming in many ways. And if you've been watching the release of the pictures from the Webb telescope, it's fantastic. You'll really get a kick out of that. So what's in the universe? We need to know that if we're gonna search for life. Well, there's space, of course, and there's energy, and there's dark matter. And there is gas and dust. And then there are galaxies and galaxy clusters. And you get a sense of how many there are in this photograph. But what we're really interested in, of course, is the elements of life. What are those elements? Well, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So carbon and hydrogen are the dominant ones in organic chemistry and in biochemistry. And so we're particularly concerned with those elements and we find them throughout the universe. We also find in meteorites and some samples on Mars, uh, organic molecules that are amino acids, and a few other things like that. So life has all the materials it needs on the planets. And what, it, what we really search for then is a planet like Earth with water in all three of its forms, vapor, solid ice, and water liquid. So then we wanna know how many of these 
Let me just clear something off of here. How many of these stars might have planets? And if we look at the number of galaxies, a recent estimate is that there are at least two trillion galaxies in the universe. And each one of them has more than 100 billion stars. So that would be if we wanted to multiply it out, two times 10 to the 12th times 10 to the 11th, or two times 10 to the 22nd. Well, I wondered what that number was called, and it turns out it's called sectillion. So that means we have 20 sectillion stars. And if each star had, let's just say, 10 planets, we'd have 200 sextillion planets to investigate in the universe. Of course, we can't get to all of them. We can only get uh, to a few. And here's where we can look for exoplanets. We now have discovered around 5,000 exoplanets, 5,054. These are planets uh, around star systems within 300 or 400 light years from our sun. And you can see on this diagram of the, or cartoon of the Milky Way <clears throat> showing our sun and the diameter of that three to 400 light years circumsphere really. And within that, we have 8,800 candidates that may be exoplanets, and they're in need of further study. And of those 50, 50, 50 excuse me, 5,000 planets, uh, they come in uh, around 3,800 planetary systems, just in that one part of the Milky Way. So there are plenty of planets out there, but most of them, them are inaccessible. This is a interstellar object. It flew through our solar system in 2017. It's pronounced Oumuamua, which is a Hawaiian name uh, referring to something as like a scout. The interesting thing about it, this is an artist's reconstruction. It flew through very fast. It was going 200,000 miles an hour and it entered the solar system, zipped around, and uh, passed by the sun in a rather uh, exciting way. It seems to be 10 times as long as it is wide. We're not quite sure, or they aren't quite sure, how long it is, but estimates range between 100 meters and 1,000 meters, and so it's only would be only uh, 100 meters to 10 meters wide. And that's unlike any other objects, at least in our solar system. And the surface seems to be smooth, shiny, and a bit reddish. And during its flight through the solar system, it did an abrupt turn at 200,000 miles per hour and shot back out against the uh, strength of the sun's gravity. So there's been a lot of speculation about what it is, but probably the most interesting one is by Harvard astronomer Avi Loeb, who looks at it as an alien light sail. He takes these three object, or three characteristics, shape, surface, and flight, and suggests that the one hypothesis that this would fit best is a spaceship from another civilization in another star system. And because he likes light sails, he has added not part of the hypothesis, but suggested that it could be a light sail. In other words, driven by the uh, light of stars or lasers. This is an interesting hypothesis, and it's the only one really based on solid uh, evidence. So in contrast, say, to SETI, which is based on uh, Frank Drake's equation, which has five or six factors in it, none of which we really can measure, 
but the conclusion is that there's a lot of stars with a lot of planets and some of them must have civilizations. So let's listen to them by radio. And as far as I know, they haven't heard anything yet. I'm sure we'd know about that instantaneously. So that's kind of exciting, but it is a hypothesis, but it looks like things can get into our solar system from outside places. Let's take a look then at our solar system. We're in the Milky Way ga galaxy, as you know, 100,000 light years across, and we're about one third of the way in. We're moving at 515,000 miles an hour, and it takes 230 million years to orbit the galaxy from our position in about a two thirds of the way out. That means that the last time it would be where we are today would have been when the dinosaurs were for very first appearing 230 million years ago. The solar system, as you know, is composed of eight planets. Let me move. I got to move something out of the way here. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and the two innermost planets are too hot, and the two outermost planets, Uranus and Neptune, are too cold. The Earth, however, is in the habitable zone now, and the habitable zone is defined as those planets that have liquid water, vapor water, and ice. And Earth has all three of those. Mars may have been in the habitable zone earlier in its history, and we'll explore that possibility. But the habitable zone includes a few oddballs. They are Jupiter's icy moons and Saturn's icy moons. And these icy moons all have oceans underneath an icy crust. And if you follow the water, as NASA urges us to do in the search for extraterrestrial organisms, then an ocean under an icy crust is a lovely target. In fact, my own opinion is, as we'll see, Europa, one of Jupiter's icy moons, is even a better target for life than Mars. So I've arranged the planets and moons in this graph showing the Earth with four symbols of life, couple of for water and triangles for ice. If we look at Mars, there's a possibility that life evolved once on Mars and may still be there in the subsurface. And it had water in the past and it's got a little bit of ice, including um, dry ice on the poles. Europa has a possibility of life. I rate it a little higher than Mars because it's got this ocean under a thick icy crust. And if we ever get to explore it, we would uh, hopefully find these life forms, whatever they are. The other two uh, icy moons of Jupiter, Ganymede and Callisto, are interesting and they both have icy crusts water under the icy crust. And then the same goes for Saturn's icy moons, Enceladus and Titan. They both have a possibility of having life, and they both have water and icy crusts on them. So we'll explore these from Mars through Titan in the rest of this lecture. Let's take a look at Earth at 3.5 billion years ago. So this is a picture from the Smithsonian Institution of what a pre-Cambrian, Archean would be the time period, would look like. And of course, we have a characteristic iconic volcanism going on. But notice down here, we have all these flat, flattened or um, mushroom-shaped objects growing in an ocean. These are made by cyanobacteria, and they trap in their mucilage on the, <coughs> excuse me, 
They trap sediment in their mucilage, which then is built into these mushroom shaped things. We still have them growing today. They grow in many places around the world. Most famous is Shark Bay Arch in uh, Australia. So this is a model of what life might have looked like at the very beginning of time. Let's take a look then at the history of life on Earth very quickly. So at 4,600 million years ago, that's 4.6 billion, Earth formed. It soon developed a magnetic field as soon as its core was developed. And the Earth's core is a fluid, iron-rich core that generates a magnetic field. That magnetic field is important to us because it protects us from the solar wind and solar radiation. We also know that there was water at about 4,007 million years ago. That's we has been detected by looking at zircon molecules and or crystals. And then life may have been present at around 4,000. But we had this uh, late heavy bombardment of asteroids in, at about uh, 3,900. And this late bombardment affected all of the interference from Mars to Mercury and probably even the other ones. So those are the basic characteristics of Earth and of Mars. So when we get to looking at Mars, we'll see that all of this is the same. <laughs> so where we differ though, is that the oldest fossils on Earth are these stromatolytic looking fossils uh, found in Australia at about 3,500 million years ago. At 32, or so, there's definitely stromatolites that were formed by cyanobacteria. And around 2,700 million years, the first eukaryotes, in other words, organisms, single cell with an organized nucleus, whereas the bacteria, like cyanobacteria, do not have an organized nucleus. Those eukaryotes and the stromatolites continue to exist through the next 2 billion years. And oxygen was generated by the cyanobacteria because they photosynthesized, and oxygen is a byproduct of that. So the first oxygen appears about 2100 million years ago. And then we see in the middle of this, around uh, 13. 100 million years, a eukaryote ra radiation of sorts. And the first animals appear shortly after the Earth had been covered by ice all over. And that has this name, the Snowball Earth. There was two of them, one very early, and Snowball Earth two. And then the first animals appear around 600 million years. From that time on, we have the radiation in the Cambrian at 543 million years of invertebrates like this trilobite, land plants like these things, and then a bunch of invertebrates and vertebrates. And then finally, uh, at the end of the Paleozoic here at 250 million years ago, a major extinction that killed off 90% of everything that came before. They re-radiated, re and the dinosaurs appeared shortly after that, and they existed all the way to 66 million years when the asteroid hit and uh, killed them off. And then mammals were able to radiate, including at about 6 million years, the first hominins that gave rise to about a dozen different species of humanoid kinds of organisms, and one of those, our own species, Homo sapiens, arose about 200,000 years ago and took over the earth, and you can see what we've done to it by looking out the windows today or just watching the news. 
not too good. So let's take a look at the uh, planets. So here's Mercury closest to the sun. And this sunny side is extremely hot, 800, 900 degrees C. And the shady side, because one side always faces the sun, this side, this opposite side is extremely cold, maybe minus 200 degrees. Unlikely place for life, although at least one guy has proposed that in this twilight zone, if there was water, you might have life arise. There's no evidence for that, so it is a speculation at this time, not even a hypothesis. So let's compare the next three planets, which are Venus, Earth, and Mars. And I want to start with Earth. When we look at its atmosphere. The pressure is one bar at the surface. That's about 15 pounds per square inch. And the temperature on the average is 14 degrees C or 57 Fahrenheit. The composition of the atmosphere is interesting. CO2, carbon dioxide, makes up 420 parts per million, much less than 1% of the atmosphere today. And that's increased enormously from pre-human activities. 77% nitrogen, less than 1% water, 21% oxygen. Almost all of that was derived from photosynthesis by plants and animals that um, do that and the bacteria, of course. Now you compare that to Venus. Venus's atmosphere is 90 bars, 90 times as dense and heavy as Earth's, and it is extremely hot, 864 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 464 degrees centigrade on the average at the surface. And the composition of its atmosphere is CO2, 96%, a little bit of nitrogen, tiny, tiny amount of water, no oxygen and a trace of argon. Mars, its atmosphere is about a hundredth of that of Earth. And it's uh, very cold. It's minus 62 C at the surface on the average. And it would be a lot colder if it weren't for the fact that it has an atmosphere that's got almost 96% carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, almost 3% nitrogen, a little bit of water, a little bit of, of oxygen, and some argon. These three planets are all greenhouse planets. In other words, the CO2 traps heat in the atmosphere. And on Venus, it has generated so much heat because Venus is closer to the sun that you get these very, very high temperatures. On Mars, the temperature is minus 62 degrees C, but it would be much colder if it weren't for this 96% CO2 in its atmosphere. But the atmosphere is so thin that uh, the temperature can rise much above 62. So we're very fortunate on Earth to have a good temperature, good atmosphere, low CO2, although it's increasing radically now on our own planet. I mean, <clears throat> So let's take a look here at Venus. This is a picture of uh, from the North Pole in false colors. And you'll notice these are volcanoes. Can you see my pointer? Yes, we can see it. OK, great. So these are volcanoes. And these are not your stand up upright volcanoes like Shasta or um, Mount Rainier. These are big, fat pancake-like volcanoes, more like a, a loaf of um, round bread with a rise in the center. So that's probably a product of the high temperatures at the surface and the high pressure in the atmosphere keeps the volcanoes looking much differently than they do on Earth. This is a picture taken by Venera 13, which was a Soviet uh, spacecraft that landed on Venus. They 
they shot a number of them there. This one landed and took several images that were received back on Earth. And you can see here, well, this is part of the spacecraft, obviously. But in the background here, you can see rocks, and they're all flattened. Again, probably because of the heat and pressure. The spacecraft, the Nera 13, lasted an hour before it burned up and stopped sending any communications back to Earth. So Venus doesn't have any life, at least as we know it. Mars is another question, however. This is what Mars looks like today. It's got volcanoes. In fact, Olympus Mons is the biggest volcano in the solar system. It's as big as New England. And there's volcanoes over in various parts. None of them are active. And then it's got this 600 long, mile long canyon that's deeper and wider than the Grand Canyon of Arizona. And we'll look at some of these places in the next few slides. So Viking returned this image in 1977. And the leader of the Viking project, Jerry, he looked at the image when they brought it in and he said, oh my God, life it looks like a civilization. So this picture though is taken at 40, 40 meters per pixel. And all these little black dots you see there and these big black dots are all missing pixels which record on the photographic image as black. So this guy, Jerry, wanted to see exactly what these were. And he had an opportunity in 1998, 20 years later, when Mars Global Surveyor had a chance to fly back over these uh, images that people had said, oh, these are pyramids and faces like the Sphinx. And this is a civilization that lived on Mars, books were written about it, TV programs, the general public went wild. But if you take a look at these images here taken at 4.3 meters per pixel, so much more resolution and not so many pixels, you can see that this is a, just a little mountain. It's got canyon here, canyon there. There's a little crater right there in this other image, and there's sediment piled up around this edge of it that gives it this sort of shelf-looking appearance. So if you look at the eyes, the eyes in this image were enhanced by having pixel, pixels blacked out, but they really are these, this canyon and the other side of that canyon. This is the nose. And that's this little ridge. You can see that ridge here coming down and with the little crater right in the end. And then the mouth is this canyon there. So this is not a civilization on Mars. Be fun if it was. Anyway, a lot of people did have fun with it, writing, as I said, books and so forth. Another occurrence of life from Mars were fossils that were found in a Martian meteorite collected in Antarctica. Apparently, every once in a while, Mars gets hit by an asteroid and it knocks pieces of Mars off of the planet at velocity and escape velocity. And several of them have landed on Earth, quite a few actually. And this one was uh, examined by scanning electron microscopes. And this object here was said to be a something like a bacterium. The problem is it's about a hundred times smaller than the smallest bacterium, and it wouldn't even it's bigger than than DNA. If you look carefully around in this image, you can see, for example, another line of these little circular things right there. Here's some over here. 
Here's a little one there. Here's looks like the beginning of some there. Some over here. So this, it turns out, is not a fossil, but it is a mineral deposit inside the meteorite. So no, it's not a fossil. So let's go on then and look at what other data there is. And these are all the landers that the United States has sent to Mars. The Soviet Union, Russia, China, and the European Space Agency have all also landed rovers or spacecraft on Mars. Viking 1 and Viking 2 in the 70s, Pathfinder landed here. They, most of the, them are all in the equatorial or sub-equatorial regions because you can land there easily. So Viking 1 and 2, Pathfinder, all in that area. And then Opportunity and Spirit in the uh, 90s, Curiosity in the early 2000s, and then Insight, which was not designed to rove around on the surface, but to sit in one spot and measure the internal structure of Mars, but it was on the surface. And then Perseverance, which landed there at the end of 2020 with a helicopter, and it's been rowing around. So Curiosity, Perseverance, and Pathfinder all our rovers, or in Pathfinder's case, had rovers, as did Opportunity and Spirit. So we want to take a look at what they saw. Here's an image from the Mars Global Surveyor. It's 300 kilometers, 186 miles wide, the image. So this crater is about 60 kilometers wide. This one would be about 30 kilometers. And the interesting thing in this image is these collapse structures. You have a, a rather smooth surface, continuous around, and then a what looks like a collapse structure, a boulder field, which is 30 or 40 kilometers long, and then a run out where you can see how it has flattened the surface. And the same thing, here's another collapse structure. Here's a collapsed structure with some boulders and then run out. These all show evidence of past water on Mars. Here's another example. These craters are about 20 kilometers across and they, are, they are, have been streamlined, sediment piled up behind by currents flowing in that direction. There's no water on the surface of Mars today, but there's apparently has been lots of water in the distant past. And if we look at the valley, uh, the Valles Marineris, this big canyon, we can see some features. For example, uh, looking down into the central part of this canyon, we can see that there's erosional features. These gullies, which are really big canyons, <clears throat> Excuse me. Big canyons that uh, end down in the uh, flat basin here, or shorelines. There's some shorelines around here, and this shoreline, really obvious, around the top of the lake. This looks like Lake Mead today with its shorelines way high up and just a little bit left over in water now. And then the lake bed and sediments. To me, this is the ideal place to look for fossils, but it's very difficult to land anything in that canyon. Not only is it a difficult target, once you get inside the canyon, you're likely to hit the sides of it rather than this lake bed, but one a day, Somebody will get there and sample that. So opportunity, uh, it took a lot of pictures and here's a panorama of material. And you can see outcrops here. You can see bedding planes going through it like that right there. And this was really exciting because it was one of the first times 
that we had a good look at rocks, sedimentary rocks that were layered. And of course, that's what every biologist and paleontologist would like to see. So up, looking up close, at uh, here's a two centimeter scale, you can see that this sediment is um, cross bedded. You can see that the sedimentary bed goes like that and then it crosses down like that. And cross beds in sedimentary rocks are a sign of current action, either by air or water. So again, an indication perhaps of water <clears throat> or at least dust blowing and accumulating uh, in, a, in a style we know from Earth quite almost everywhere. Notice also these little round pellets. We'll see more of those in this photograph. Uh, they're all over the place. These are round concretions that erode out of this sediment. And it turns out they're uh, ferrous hydroxides, which means that it's an iron rich uh, concretion that formed in water. So this is an indication of either surface waters or ground waters. And then these concretions form and weather out as you see here. There's a place in Utah where this happens on Earth, so we can test that hypothesis on Earth. I received this picture from the Opportunity Science crew, and they thought this might be a fossil. They thought it might be the stem of a crinoid, you know, sea lily. They have a stem and then a, a lily-like a cup at the top called the calyx that has feathery arms on it by which it catches food. And they thought that maybe this was that. But when I look at it, I can see that all of these things are also there. And it, so this little column is not alone. Furthermore, if you look at this place where there's a break seemingly between these columns, or not the columns, but the pieces in the columns, you can see that the crack goes back into the rock like that. And it's especially well developed here, going back there. So this, in my mind, is a weathering phenomenon. It just happens to be somewhat similar to a crinoid on Earth, but it's not a fossil. It's a weathering phenomenon. Well, per perseverance and ingenuity flew in, as did um, curiosity, on a sky train. Train. The sky train works like this. There's a parachute that attaches to this sky train, which holds the rover up inside its belly. And as it approaches the surface of the planet, the parachute is detached and floats away, and then this sky train fires its rockets and lowers the whole assembly down, and then lowers this down, and then flies away on its own. So this is what happened with Perseverance, which had ingenuity tucked in underneath here someplace, when it landed at Jezero Crater on Mars. The idea that Perseverance was set there to do was to study astropaleontology. They finally decided that there was no life on the surface of Mars, but that there was water at least before 3.5 billion years ago. And there was a chance as on Earth that there may have been some life developed. So its objective is astropaleontology, but also astrogeology because you can't do paleontology without geology. And since it's sitting on the surface, they're gonna look for paleoclimatological information as well. And this is still up there as are most of the other of uh, those rovers. So it landed in Jezero Crater and they chose this site after looking at hundreds of sites on Mars because it had a river that flowed out into this crater and created a delta. So let's see, that's about where Perseverance landed. 
And this is the crater wall of Jezero. There's the river. The upper left arrow points to a, a wide, big river. And the lower points to a narrow chasm that's been eroded through the crater wall and then flows out into the crater to form that delta, which you can see uh, the flow comes out in this direction and there's an impact crater right there. And so that's the delta. Perseverance now is located about it's approaching this edge of this delta, and it's taken a number of photographs that show, again, cross-fetted sedimentary rocks, sort of like what we saw with the opportunity pictures. And um, it's also collecting cores as it goes. And that's the important part for astropaleontology. So here's some two core holes they drilled in this rock exactly why they chose that rock, I don't know. Um, but these cores that they're taking, they have the capacity to take 36 cores and they've already now taken six. They are about the size of a pencil, but not necessarily as long as a pencil. So here's, as I said, one of the core sites, and this is it up close. It's about an inch across. You can see the drilling mass here. And then the core itself is contained within a core catcher. And that core catcher, along with five others, has been stored in a special piece of equipment where the other 30 cores will be placed when they collect those. Those sample or that sample set will then be picked up by a spacecraft in the year 2031, probably. So Perseverance is also surveying for sample return landing sites. Again, it has to be a big smooth area, and then they'll set the sample container out where the return spacecraft can pick it up. That spacecraft will then go up to a satellite that's going around Mars, where then it will be transferred to another one, another spacecraft that will deliver it to Earth in 2031 or 32. That's the plan. And we're all excited to see what that might have. So let's just then summarize Mars's early history. It formed at the same time Earth did, 4,600 year, million years ago. It developed a magnetic field. We can see that magnetic field uh, when we run magnetometer around it in a satellite, but it's only found in the oldest rocks, not in the young rocks. And there's apparently water and possibly life before the late uh, heavy bombardment that Earth also experienced at about 3.9 billion years old. So that's the same sequence as we have on Earth. So life may have thrived at about 35, 100 million years ago on Mars, but then the magnetic field stopped. Mars is only a quarter the size of Earth and through convection, its core, which had been fluid, solidified. And once it's solid and magnetic field no longer can be generated. And once that stops, then the atmospheric stripping begins. And that's done by the solar radiation coming from the sun, which is protected by a magnetic field. If we didn't have a magnetic field, we'd be dead in a couple of minutes. So on Mars, it stripped the atmosphere and the planet died. And this is what the dead planet looks like with the lower parts you know, of the topography painted in blue. They like to do that because then it looks like an ocean. Here's the big canyon. Here's the volcanoes. They're all dead. It's a, just a big solid ball of rock. 
It's got layers of sediment, as we've explored already on it. And it has been like this for three and a half billion years. So it differs significantly from Earth at about 3.5 billion. And there it is again, a rusty looking, dusty, hardly any atmosphere, very cold, minus 62 blob out in the solar system. And we want to go there at least Elon Musk wants to go there and a few other billionaires. Good luck to them. I think uh, radiation is a big, big super problem. Just getting there could kill them by radiation unless they're going to fly a lead airplane. I don't see the uh, pictures of their spacecrafts surviving. Anyway, we'll see. I was once on a planning uh, meeting that lasted for five days at NASA where we planned a six person mission to Mars. And uh, it could be any six people, any age, any sex, any, any characteristics. And other than that, uh, we were free to uh, plan however we wanted to do that. And of course, one thought was, well, we constantly thought was, we send them there, but then we bring them back. I suggested, why don't we get some older people, send them there, and just leave them. I mean, I would do it, thought at the time. And they said, oh, no, 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 we, we would have to bring you back. I said, why? I mean, I'd be famous. Well, I've rethought that. Dying of radiation is not what I, the way I want to die. So I'm going to stay here on Earth. I'll let Eon go. So our conclusions then are, life may be present, but only as fossils, not extant life, most likely. From the early water stages, earlier than about 3.5 billion years, because the water that had been on the surface, it all got lost to uh, outer space once the atmosphere started stripping away. And this means that we need a strong paleontological sampling, sampling strategy, such as uh, Perseverance is doing on, Ma on Mars now. And maybe we'll know by 2032. I'd love to see that. Well, that takes care of the three or four inner planets. And let's go look at Jupiter's Galilean satellites because these are the icy moons except for Io. So the fifth Galilean satellite is Io and it is the volcanically most active body in the solar system. Everything you see there, all these spots on Io, which is a, a bit bigger than our moon. Europa is about the size of our moon. So that's a good comparison. Um, all of these are active volcanoes and you can see them spouting ash and lava from spacecrafts. So it's not a likely place for life. Europa is an icy planet or satellite. It's got an icy crust. It's got water underneath that icy crust. It flies in the radiation belts of Jupiter, which makes it difficult to uh, observe because it burns up cameras. And then Ganymede, which is the largest satellite in the solar system, uh, it has a, a series of plates on a body of ice with a water underneath. And you can tell by the number of crater impact, impact craters that this is a somewhat older crust than the one on Europa. And then Callisto out here looks a lot like the moon. It's got so many craters. But again, it's an icy moon with apparently an ocean underneath that icy crust. So I want to take a look at Europa in particular. So it's about the size of the moon. 
the surface is young, that doesn't mean that the planet, I mean, the moon is young. The moon is probably as old as the solar system. So 4.6 billion years, but the surface has been resurfaced. And that last time that happened was probably 60 million years ago because the crater counts here would give you an age of 60 million years. And the crust is dynamic. We can see that in the ice, which may be five kilometers thick. Some people think it could be 10 or even more thick. There's certainly tidal energy generated by the fact that when this moon goes around Jupiter, it is stressed uh, tremendously by the tides of Jupiter. It receives sunlight, not as much as we get, obviously, and maybe there's life in the water below. So let's consider what, what can life endure? What kind of energy sources does it need? Are icy worlds good abodes for life? What icy habitats does life utilize? And how does life evolve on an icy world? Well, we can answer some of those questions right here on Earth. So let me show you. Here is a core taken in the Arctic Ocean. And when we examine this core from the top, there was this greenish brown material in here. And it turned out it was all diatoms and other microorganisms, plus a little dust. And they were all alive. So they're living in the interstitial water in brine channels. As seawater freezes, it squeezes the salts out of the seawater because uh, as that water crystallizes and it forms channels that these organisms uh, use as a habitat. This happens in all sea ice environments on Earth. We've looked at them in Antarctica as well. So cracks and fissures, this is the McMurdo ice, uh, glacial sh ice shelf. And you can see as it comes around this point that it cracks in many different places. And although it's very thick, it's very thin where these cracks are. In fact, it's so thin right in here that seals pop through in holes that they drill with their teeth and then they lie around and sometimes die up here. So life as we know it here on Earth deals with this kind of an environment in Antarctica today. This is a, two pictures of ice, uh, of life under ice sea habitats. So the picture on the right is a picture at 620 meters deep in the Ross Ice Shelf. The ice on the Rice Ice Shelf at this uh, site where we drilled through the ice shelf was 400 meters thick, 420 meters thick, with a 200 meter uh, bit of ice, excuse me, a bit of water under the ice. And here we lowered a TV camera with a hunk of seal meat hanging on a chain below it to see what would be attracted. And within 20 minutes, this fish appeared. And so did thousands of amphipods, a kind of crustacean, and other organisms, isopods, and single cell organisms like foraminifera. This picture on the left shows, is at 130 feet deep below a semi-permanent ice, which is 15 feet thick. And you can see here, there are white sponges here in the background. The top fuzzy things on it are crinoids that live on top of them. All these things on the bottom are scallops, clams. And there's lots and lots of other things that don't show up on this photograph. So the fact they live under, water, under ice, whether it's fairly shallow and it's thin ice or very deep and with thick ice doesn't seem to bother these things at all. 
they acquire food from other places and they respond very quickly to food. And then there's these piles of debris. This is sediment that's come to the surface of this ice shelf uh, because the ice shelf hit the bottom and captured the sediment. And then the ice at the surface sublimated and all of this became exposed, including this beautiful sponge going here with uh, Bob and myself. And these fossils, there's lots of them. There's clams and other things in these piles of debris. These are uh, 30, 40 feet pile, foot piles of sediment and dating these clams with um, carbon 14 gives a date 4,000 years ago. So they were once alive 4,000 years ago when they I shall tag them on the bottom. So it looks like life's habitats in icy environments are not a problem. Here is a cross section, let's say through Europa. It's got an ice covering. And then there's a pelagic environment, open ocean that would be. And organisms could live in there, plankton that drifts and nekton that swims. And then there are benthic environments like the sub-ice. Organisms can live on the bottom of the ice. They can live on different substrates on the sea floor. And they can live on the vents that surely exist on the bottom of the ocean on Europa. So these are the kinds of habitats that I proposed in a paper on Europa's life, uh, we had actually pinpointed about 26 separate habitats that could be sampled someday. That was a key. So the ice habitats on the surface of Europa would be these. The background picture here is a close up of the surface of Europa showing these big uh, cracks uh, of different ages. You can tell that because they cross one another. So this one is older than this one, which crosses it. And they provide habitats for life at the surface or near the surface. The radiation at Europa is pretty extreme, but after a meter and a half, according to the radiologists that were with our group, uh, the radiation has been uh, significantly reduced so that life could live under a meter and a half of ice. So maybe not right at the surface, but places along the surface where the radiation load, load is not very severe, like in fissures, cracks, brine channels, on ice substrates in different ways, and maybe even intracrystal water fills might contain <clears throat> life. So all these things can be explored. Here's another example. The broken and collapsed icy pieces here. You can see that there are big pieces and sometimes you can reconstruct them and put them together like you can with this piece and these pieces. But out here in the middle, there's big chunks of it missing. So that ice has either uh, disintegrated or sunk. And these uh, as you know, I look at this as a paleontologist, and I'd love to go and look at these sides of these things and also look at these tilted ones like this one's tilted up and get an idea of what's on the bottom. It's just, a, for me, a paradise. And then here along these fissures, they often have this darkened color on the younger ones. So this is a young crack, here's an, a little older crack. You can see they cross the, pat, the structures. This one comes like that. So these are not faults that's causing a displacement laterally. They're cracks without displacement, uh, except maybe for up and down. And they might be in the tidal 
uh, situation in Jupiter being moved open and closed, open and closed, and sort of in a pumping motion, pumping water and maybe sediment from the ocean below up onto the surface. And you can see that along these cracks. We can see a similar thing in the um, in Prell Crater, for example. There are several of these craters. And you can see the ejecta blanket. Here's the crater. Here's the ejecta that came out of the, the uh, crater when the me meteorite or asteroid hit. And again, it's darker in color. And it looks like plenty of stuff uh, was kicked up from deeper down in the ice, maybe even deepest the water below the ice shelf. And then there's this picture. Look at it carefully because this is a cliff that's about 300 feet high. This is another cliff over there. And if you look carefully below this cliff, there are alluvial fans of debris falling off and rolling out down slope. And you can see big boulders in here. Another place to look. Life could be living in or near these boulders. It could be living in a radiogenic uh, shadow along a cliff face. So there are plenty of opportunities on the surface of Europa to find these things in future expeditions, which would be way in the future. We could even do evolution because we can tell uh, what the relative ages of these different parts of the surface ice is. Here's the oldest, this pattern right here, you see it all over. And then that pattern is cut by these kinds of features labeled with the two. And then that one is cut by three. So that's younger than two. And then four destroys this one. So this whole collapse structure is younger than three. And then <clears throat> five is even more, young, even younger. Six is young and seven is the youngest. And you put this together and maybe you have 60 million years of evolution that you might be able to track someday. So anyway, that's the way a paleontologist, or at least this one, thinks about stuff like this. There's lots and lots of things to think about besides just what life is there. Okay, let's quickly look at Titan, Saturn's moon. It's about the size of Ganymede. It's got clouds, rain, river, lakes, and seas of liquid hydrocarbons. Its atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, and its surface press, <clears throat> press, press, pressure is about one and a half bars. And it's got this color because the atmosphere is loaded with clouds of hydrocarbons. Let's look at the structure of Saturn's moon, Titan. And we see that it has a rock core. Above the rock core is a layer of ice, high pressure ice. High pressure ice is different than ice in your refrigerator. It is like a hard, hard rock, like diamond almost. Above that is a layer of salty water and then an icy crust above that on which lakes and rivers and the atmosphere, which you can see all around here, are formed. When we looked at the surface with the Huygens probe, it was dropped in and landed. And here are boulders. And these boulders are of hydrocarbons of one sort or another, methane or ethane, and similar kinds of things. And here's a lake of hydrocarbons. Well, this doesn't look so terrific for life like we know, but all the elements for life, the hydrocarbons, are present on Titan. And then Enceladus, Saturn's other moon with, and the, these both Jupiter and Saturn have 60 or 70 moons, but, and I'm only looking at a few from each one, just two from uh, Saturn. Enceladus is about 500 kilometers in diameter, and it's an icy ocean world, and it's spraying geysers of water and icy slush. And 
one of the objectives that NASA will soon do, I think, is to fly a satellite through that icy spray to capture a sample. Well, there are different ways to think about how to find life. You can have a lander. My vision for a lander is like a soccer ball. You drop it down, it's got sensors all over it, and it bounces around and sends messages back. A penetrator penetrates through the ice and uh, perhaps has radioactive material in it, so it has a heat source, and then it has to trail an antenna back to the surface. And some imaginative artist at NASA put this together, a uh, Europa Ocean Explorer. How you'd ever get that down there, at least in our lifetimes, it won't happen. Maybe it'll never happen. And then more rovers. Now, will rovers work well on a planet like Europa with wheels? I don't know. The characteristics of the ice at the surface of Europa are quite different. The surface is minus 250 or so centigrade. But in the absence of wheels, some of my colleagues at Berkeley are designing robots based on spiders and turtles and other organisms. So we could have a spidel bot, a turtle bot, or a spital bot. But my favorite is a penguino bot. <laughs> Penguino bot is propelled by flippers in the back and steered by flippers on the side. And then it scoots along on the bottom. And here's the instrument panel up here and taking photographs and observations. And maybe you could even dump it into the ocean of Europa. Well, so far, nothing yet, just us. We are the only life known in the universe. But keep looking, we're out there. Thanks very much. Questions? Okay, so if anybody has any questions, what do we got here? We'll have somebody in the chat. Oh. Okay. Um, Um, <clears throat> nobody asking any questions. Yeah, yeah, a couple of here. Well, come up here and talk to the microphone so he can hear you and we all can hear you. That'll be great. Thanks for your attention. The, uh, the subject title had to do something with uh, ET, and so we're talking about maybe a uh, some sort of intelligent life. And you've really uh, played on the whole idea of uh, life in general. But I just wonder uh, what you think of UFOs. And uh, I, it, as maybe a, a signal of intelligent life and also do they come from uh, a pretty close range? Because I, I, I don't know what, the lifespan of a <laughs> uh, extraterrestrial person would be, but they, it seems like they'd, ha they'd have to be pretty close to us. And um, we might be able to even travel ourselves to something like that. Well, the nearest star is what, four and a half uh, light years away. And uh, you'd have to travel pretty damn fast to get there. And that's why um, Logue wants to use light sails because you can get pretty fast in a light sail. However, I know that 60% of Americans believe that UFO does not mean unidentified flying object, but means alien spacecraft. There is no evidence whatsoever that there are aliens out there. There's a lots and lots of inference, suggestions, and fantasies, but no solid evidence. I won't believe it until I see the body of one, not a photograph, 
or not a museum full of them like they have in Ro Roswell. These are all fantasies. And if you think about it, uh, show me the evidence. There is none, not even that the evidence that came off of the uh, pilots flying off San Diego with dots on their radio, on their uh, oscilloscopes or whatever they were. That's insufficient. So we have no evidence that we're being spied on by anybody from another planet uh, or another solar system. It would sure be fun. I'd give you that. And I hope that someday we see them, but we have no evidence whatsoever. Sorry to say that. And ET in my title means extraterrestrial, not extraterrestrial, alien, but extraterrestrial life in general. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, actually, two questions. One is, is the water underneath Enceladus uh, salt or fresh? And then second of all, um, how conceivably would a planet near to a star maintain a thick atmosphere without a magnetic field, you know, in the presence of solar wind? So hopefully those two questions are enough. Well, in the presence of a solar wind, the solar wind would blast the atmosphere off unless it was continually uh, replenished. Um, and the way that we do exoplanets is mostly by looking at how much a star is dimmed by a planet moving across the, the sphere of the, or the circle of the star that we see in a telescope. And so most of the exoplanets that we've discovered are, are big ones like Jupiter size, not Earth size. And those, have, those of course are gaseous planets but they're so large and they have such heavy gravity that they can preserve their atmosphere. So your first question was? Enceladus is ocean, uh, solar. Yes. Yeah. So all of these um, <clears throat> satellites of Jupiter and Saturn uh, were flown by with a magnetometer. And with the magnetometers, you can uh, detect the layering and you can detect the density of the layering too. And with their, the kinds of manipulations they're able to do, like with the uh, Galileo spacecraft that explored Jupiter and all of its moons, they can tell what the layers are and they are heavier, the water layers, uh, than fresh water. So they would have to have salts in them. We don't know okay. what salts, but presumably like the ocean. Interesting. Oh, thank you. Very nice talk. Oh, thank you. It's fun. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, yeah. There, there was a, a flight taken out to a uh, comet and they sampled, they sampled the comet and they were looking to see the ratio of water versus heavy water to see if it was uh, a signature uh, to maybe verify the theory that Earth's oceans were from a bombardment of comets. Right. But the ratio didn't match the, the Earth's oceans. That's right, um, I guess I recall. If, if, they, <clears throat> if they test the they're going to fly, do flybys of Europa on the south where, the, where there's spouts. If they test Europa's water and it has an equal ratio of heavy water versus water to Earth's oceans, what does that say about Earth's ocean's origin? Well, uh, it appears that Earth's oceans <clears throat> did not arise from many comets but it arose from the water in the mantle of the earth. The earth's mantle contains more water than any that exists at the surface. And it's being released in volcanic eruptions. So that's the original source, uh, original hypothesis for the source of water. And I think it's still valid mostly. So the water was already here. Yeah, it was captured. Um, 
partly from comments that uh, arrived during the various bombardments and the, the accumulation of the planets originally four and a half billion years ago. Okay. And buried inside of these planets. Okay, but they didn't, the, they tested the comets and the heavy water ratio was not uh, equal to the Earth's oceans. Right. So most of the water on the Earth comes from its interior in the mantle. Cat captured in its, when it was formed? Well, uh, yeah, well, all the all the planetary origination was complete after the the heavy bombardment at about three point nine billion, and uh, you begin to form them, and then the gravity of that mass causes separation of all the elements, so that the heavy ones like iron go to the core. The mantle is made up of other minerals, some of which uh, disintegrate into water. And so the mantle has, as I said, uh, a very large amount of water. And it comes out in volcanoes, along with CO2 and other stuff. Okay, thank you. Over millions of years. So it's a long process. Are there any uh, chat questions at the moment? Uh, we have what he fielded here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, very good talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hmm? Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, I think that'll wrap it up then. Um, I think everybody's. Uh, Happy enough with that? Hmm? Oh, that's Randy John. He's clapping. Oh. <clears throat> uh, I don't see anybody else on here. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have been here. Bye bye. Thanks, David. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.